Okay, now that we're getting closer, let's talk about the logistics of machining these parts and how we're going to accomplish that. Welcome back everybody. I'm not sure what video number this is on this series, so uh, forgive me. I just had a few minutes, so I wanted to uh, pop in. And I actually, for the first time, did some work that I didn't record. And I was just fiddling around over the weekend at home with the file and got a little, I won't say carried away, but uh, I really didn't do that much. But the, the appearance is, is definitely different. And that is mostly all that I did was I applied this uh, sort of black glossy appearance to the body and the cover, uh, sort of like an anodized uh, aluminum, the chrome look on the uh, RCA. Um, yeah, so that's that's mostly what I ended up doing. So uh, I did a couple little adjustments with the uh, geometry of the components themselves. What I ended up doing mostly is, let's see, get a front view here. Um, I told you I wanted to go back and adjust the collet so that it saw, uh, sits properly down in the collet nut with these uh, angles here. And basically, I have far more clearance here than I need, but I wanted plenty. I left a millimeter of clearance between the nut and the uh, machine body, and I left a millimeter between the back of the collet and the machine body. And basically, if the collet nut itself here, or the collet itself is cut close to tolerance, this really only needs to, uh, the nut itself only needs to be threaded and, and tightened up, I don't know, maybe maybe ten thousandths of an inch, like maybe maybe a quarter of a millimeter. So uh, having a full millimeter adjustment there is, is, is excessive. It's, it's, it's a lot of space that doesn't need to be there, but I also wanted to make sure I didn't run short on that space. So, and the way I did this was, let's see, let me turn off analysis and isolate the collet nut. There we go. Um, when I first had created this, I didn't have this, uh, this flat on here. Uh, it came down at one angle and then immediately chamfered back to the nose. Um, just added that one millimeter of a straight uh, cylinder uh, is how I wanted to make that difference. And what ends up happening is that when, where is it again? Okay. So basically, if you could picture these angular lines coming out, if they were to continue past this, they would extend down to around this area here. So the, this coming down just cylindrical ensures that the collet can, in fact, get pushed back up into that, uh, into that taper uh, comfortably. So uh, that was the only real mechanical change that I made other than I think I worked on the cover just a little bit. And why can't I see it all of a sudden? Here we go. Okay, let's isolate that part and turn the analysis off. Um, I made this cutout, this U-shaped cutout here on the cover, which accommodates the pusher bar and a pusher bar mount. Uh, you can see where that, you need that open there for the bar to be able to go up and down and, and come in at the angles that it needs to. Um, I 
did check for clearance. I have I have enough clearance for the uh, uh, push bar to not hit the sides of the two or the housing. Um, so that's all taken care of. Uh, the way I came up with this cutout was I simply, let's see, turn these off. Um, all I did really was I projected this edge of this cutout, this cavity that we created. Um, I projected that edge up onto the bottom side of the cover face, and then I just extruded uh, or cut that component out of the cover. So it was a, it was a relatively simple procedure, nothing, nothing fancy. Now, I know as I was just uh, turning on the visibility of this component, you saw one other thing that I did um, that I kind of forgot about too, was I, I modeled the raw stock. So basically, what you see here is what the basic aluminum block is going to look like that I'm going to go into my fixturing. fixturing. So um, this is my first time really messing with fourth axis rotary. And in addition to the fourth axis rotary, I have a small tombstone coming in. Um, which is going to hold four parts, and I'll show you here in a second, but it holds four separate parts. Now they can be four of the same parts, they can be four uh, independent parts, and you just have different uh, cutting programs run for each face, or one cutting program running on all four faces if they're the same products. But um, I'm going to be using some parts from a company called Fifth Axis, which has a nice little uh, dovetail clamping feature. Uh, you can see I cut the, I'm going to have to cut dovetails into the bottom of the uh, raw stock. And then this, this uh, radius here is a, is a location uh, system. So what it allows, the dovetails allow great holding force to this product with the majority of the material being held up out of like, say a traditional clamp. Um, so, or vice, so, and let me turn on the, the bodies in there. So you can see the way I did this, um, for my own OCD purposes or whatever, I did the, uh, I have the center of the tube vice in the center of the stock. And there's a couple reasons I did that. And it's going to be for, um, just simplification of machining for the most part. So if you look at it from the profile view, it looks like the, the body of the machine is way to the back, but it's actually centered and just the, uh, the RCA housing is what's kind of like looks off balanced here in the back. I could in theory get away with a smaller block of aluminum, but uh, uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to go with, I believe, one and a half inch square aluminum stock, and it'll come up with a little more aluminum waste, but it will also allow me to keep that one stock on hand that I plan on using for a number of different things, just uh, for inventory purposes. It's way easier to minimize the different uh, bar stocks I have laying around. So you can see I come within about a millimeter and a half of the top of the block, about a millimeter of the back of the block, which helps because if the bars come with any dings or scratches, then uh, uh, the product will actually be cut out of the interior and just completely fresh aluminum from all directions. And there's probably about a millimeter uh, in the bottom here too. So uh, everything you see from the that is not consistent the body will be uh, going out in the scrap barrels and recycled uh, through the proper channels here. We, we bring big buckets of uh, aluminum down to the scrap yard. Uh, they buy it back from us. We get almost nothing for it, but uh, it is recycled. So uh, try not to be that wasteful 
or if we are going to be wasting any materials, we want to make sure they are going to be recycled whenever possible. Okay, so now you can see how the machine body is going to fit within the aluminum block. Uh, honestly, 75% of that aluminum uh, is going to be removed into shavings, uh, possibly more. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out exactly with weight when we get going later. We'll, rate, we'll weigh uh, an aluminum block to start with, then we'll weigh the finished product, and then we'll know percentage-wise how much uh, gets uh, goes out in the scrap bin. Um, let me see here. Uh, let me show you the what we're going to be cutting this on. All right. Just waiting for this file to open. And it's a big one, so it might take a second. Here it comes. All right. This right here is a two scale model of uh, the VF2SS that I will be using to cut this product. So, this is with the enclosure on it. So, what the machine looks like, you know, from the the front, the left side, the rear, the right side. Um, I turn off the enclosure, and that's the protective shell that keeps the whole warehouse from getting littered with uh, metal shards or potentially broken tools. Um, I've taken the time to model up the rotary on the left side of the table. I am also using a uh, Pearson, um, I believe he calls it a smart plate, and it's a 1.9 inch thick, which is awesome because it raises the rotary up off the table uh, and gives me more rotational swing around the, the tombstone so I could cut larger parts if I wanted to. I don't really need that with this particular project, but it's nice to have. But as you can see, what this plate does, um, the cutting reach of the spindle actually is just about, I've got it just about centered to the, the face of the, uh, the rotary table now. This plate allows me to securely mount the rotary table as far to the right as possible to utilize as much of the uh, work envelope of the machine as I possibly can. So you can see where the spindle lines up, just about in line with the face. This is uh, serves a second purpose. If I accidentally miscode something, misprogram something, the cutting tool can, it can reach the face of the, uh, the, the platen on the rotary. Um, but considering all of my machinings are gonna be done roughly well, what's the distance on there? Um, distance from the face to, let's say, the center of the uh, the clamping vise. So that's not working. Well, let's try and do it this way. Just go to that point. Uh, probably almost five inches away. So um, kind of ensures or helps the fact that I hopefully don't misprogram something and cut into the very expensive rotary table. Uh, even though this tombstone is fairly expensive itself, um, it's nowhere near the cost of uh, repairing or replacing the rotary table. So you can kind of see, you know what, let me turn off the machine. Err... Uh, Let's turn off everything but the, well, let's turn the vices off too. Okay. So now you can see I've got this tombstone. It's four-sided fixture. There's one of these dovetail vices on uh, each of four sides. And if you look closely, you can see the, the dovetail features in the clamps. 
and there's another rear dovetail angle on this uh, this face here and this round locating pin will fit into this cavity here so basically I will mount up either four of the same blocks on this or like I said it could be four different components if I wanted I could do uh, well, I could do first operations of uh, all four components uh, that we need, or four of the components that we need for this machine on uh, one operation. And then in one of the vices, um, we can create some soft jaws for second ops of, uh, of the components. So in theory, I'd like to set it up where I have four operations running on the tombstone, and then I could probably get you know, six or eight operations running in the dual jaw set of soft jaws here. And if I needed to, I do have another vice over here. Either way, um, I'd like to set this up where, other than there's a couple components that are going to come off the lathe first. But when I take the parts off the lathe and the first operation is done in the tombstone here and any second operation is being done in soft jaws over here, uh, in theory, every time I press cycle start, I would be getting enough components to have one finished machine. Um, that's kind of counterintuitive to uh, what I'm doing with another project, which I'm not ready to share yet, which I run large quantities of... Uh, of individual components. Uh, this is just a different approach. Um, in theory, I, if I wanted to serial number all the parts and something like this, I could I could do that where each component would have a specific serial number and each component would stay with the same machine throughout the building process. That's not what we're doing here. But I just wanted to give you an idea on how this is going to uh, uh, look, let me see. We'll quickly see if we let's go over here. Motor housing. Let's save a copy of this as to uh, sure. Save it into this part project and. All right, where did it? Okay, here it is. And let's try and give you a slightly better idea as to how this is going to work. Um, Two hundred seventy degrees. Let's uh, drag this back. This is not going to be exact by any means, but uh, I'm just getting in the uh, approximate vicinity here. I could I could locate it perfectly, but you can kind of see what it's going to look like uh, these dovetails are going to sit down into well you know what let's do this why not let's let's just uh, it's easy enough to do let's just use our fancy little align function um, basically I want to Take the center of that circle there and align it with that there and rotate the part till I get it where I want it. Okay, there. Now that part is, is located in the clamp where it would 
physically be during the machining process. Um, actually, it's low a couple of thousands because uh, the block sits on the top face. You can see a little overlap there, but it's as close as it needs to be right now. I'm not ready to start modeling the uh, the cam. Oop, and we did not bring the part down with it, so, okay. Well, you get the idea. Let me just Z out of that. Just go where I was in the first place here. Um, so basically, if you can just visualize four of these blocks located in each of these clamps, the machine will come in and uh, each tool will come in and do its job in all four positions, rotate around, and uh, saves time that way there. To, the, the tool comes out once, it works on four parts. It uh, goes back into the holder, the next tool's grab, comes out, works on the four parts. So you're streamlining the whole process with something like this. And basically, what you'll end up with is um, putting in a block like this, and it won't come out a completely finished product, but when I turn the machine off, I will have pretty much four of these completely done, other than this lower threading. Uh, the bottom cavity tube and the uh, the taper and from here down will probably just still be the large square block attached to the uh, uh, the clamp so we'll release that we'll flip the part over uh, upside down into a custom made set of soft jaws over here then we will come in and finish indicate the part in so we know exactly what its coordinates are and then we will come in uh, cut this finished diameter, thread this, uh, bore it, put the taper in, and basically that component will be done. But that's just one of the parts we'll be making. But I wanted to give you an idea of the uh, the modifications I did. I apologize I did them without you, but uh, uh, the nerd in me over the weekend just sort of uh, while I was home, I needed to just look at it, and then I can't just look at it. I had to tweak it a uh, little bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Other than changing a fillet, you know, a, a, a contour radius or something here and there, I think this part is essentially done. And uh, we won't know until we make at least one set of pieces physically and ensure that they do interact together. At that point, we'll find any last minute bugs. I uh, have to kind of go back to the drawing board, uh, find a solution fix it, adjust it, and then uh, and hopefully come up with what's very close to a finished product at that point. And then we'll just be dialing in uh, fits, tolerances, things like that. So anyways, uh, I wanted to keep this one short, unlike the other ones, give you guys an update. And yeah, we're expecting the new rotary to show up, uh, I believe, tomorrow, maybe Friday. And I think the fifth axis uh, vice tombstone and, and dovetail clamp should be here. And the following week, we'll work on getting the uh, system set up and aligned on the machine. Uh, probably do something much simpler than this for some testing out of the, uh, the new equipment and learning the, uh, the cam software is going to be a whole new uh, world for me because I've never really done it before. Um, can't be much more complicated than what I'm used to programming, except for I'm adding a whole different rotational that uh, that a axis rotating. So, and at right now I'm not looking to do full uh, four axis simultaneous cutting where uh, everything's moving at once. Right now I'm really going to use the uh, the the rotary tool more as an indexer to hold the part in a certain rotation position while the tools work on it. And once I get comfortable with that, then I'll work in doing the full fourth axis uh, simultaneous stuff, which is super impressive. And when I get to that point, I'll try and share that with you guys too on whatever project I'm doing at that time. So yes, we are going to put this into production we will be doing a limited run in the beginning. Uh, that probably means a very short run of maybe 50 machines uh, just to start with. 
Uh, I'll build a couple of prototypes. I'll use them. I will pass them around to some sponsored artists and friends and uh, get some feedback before we make the small run. Uh, but when we do do the first run, it'll probably only be 50 machines. Uh, if you're interested, uh, let me know in the comments below. Email the guys at uh, customer service guys at cs at needlejig.com. Uh, depending upon the response we get here while we're releasing these videos, and you know, we, we may bump that run up from 50 to 100, but I will not put into uh, uh, large production, anything like that. That's not my game, anyways. Um, I'm doing this to have just you know, we always had our own in house brand of machines, uh, small production runs. We're not looking to reinvent the machine every four months and set the world on fire and, and get you to buy the latest and greatest three times a year. Uh, it's not what we do. I just know how I, I, I think once you get good solid tattoo machines, uh, you can run them for years and years and years. It's always good to try something new, but, uh, uh, reliability, stability, and, uh, consistency, I think is, uh, a key component in tattooing. So that's what I'm shooting for. Uh, we will do this, uh, which is going to be a simple rotary direct drive machine uh, that allows the use of a tube or an adjustable tube for your cartridges. Um, I am working on a pen. In fact, I'm, I've got two designs that I've been uh, flirting with for a very, very, very long time. The new equipment will help me to, to make these. I'm not making any promises anytime soon. I don't want to put anything on the market until I know it's... Uh, it meets my my standards and I know it's going to be reliable. So anyways, uh, my quick update, not so quick after all, because I'm just talking, but that's it. That's what I wanted to show you. It's what I wanted to tell you. So uh, definitely hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button that makes YouTube happy and share these videos with your friends. I need people, that are artists that you think may have an interest in it and uh, we can all grow together. So thanks for watching. I am so excited about the new tools coming. I can't even tell you. I'm like a little kid on Christmas right now. But did I dig myself into a hole I may not be able to get out of? You know, I mean, I've never done anything like this before with this particular tooling. So I've got a lot to learn. Stay tuned to the next episode. We'll get through it together.